that at this very moment the world is teeming with important events. A man in Hong Kong, for instance, is preparing to force his way into a bank at the point of a gun, unaware of the fact that the police are waiting for him, that he will die very shortly with three bullets in his back. A woman in Hollywood, California, is about to take a screen test that will eventually make her the most envied woman in America. A gentleman in Peoria, Illinois, has invented a new kind of mousetrap, but is destined for a heartbreaking disappointment when he discovers that the world will not be the path to his door for it, as advertised. And at this very moment, a man named Charlie Gifford is stepping into his modest home after a hard day's work to face his destiny. I'm home, Hazel. Set him home. I heard you. Well, that's a fine way to greet a guy when he gets back from a ten-hour stint in the office. If you don't like it, you can lump it. Is dinner ready? Sure. Just open up a couple of cans. What? And don't cut your fingers. All right. What are you reading? Those ads again? Buying yourself another $5,000 mink? The ads in the papers are as close as I'll ever get to one on your salary. What's the matter with my salary? Seventy-five bucks a week for a married couple ain't so bad. Not if you don't mind living like a termite. Now listen, Hazel. You promised me sable and diamonds when I married you. Well, what have I got? Skunk and rhinestones. You told me what kind of a big shot you were going to be. You're big all right when it comes to talk, but that's all. Oh, I haven't been such a bad husband to you, Hazel. I wouldn't rave. Well, I try to act like a guy with responsibilities, don't I? But you, you, you act like a dame who married me for my bank account. Bank account? No self-respecting bank would handle our nickels. Well, I'm tired of it, Charlie. Sick and tired. Now the women get trips to Europe and fancy clothes. All I get are promises. Oh, Hazel, that's not fine. I'm tired. I don't know why you even come home at all. It's always the same old thing all over again. Yeah, and you always start. I don't. You do. I don't. You do. Oh, shut up. Uh, all right. What now? I don't know. You you want to call it quits? Maybe. D don't you love me anymore, Hazel? Why should I love you? Where does it get me? Oh, you know I'm always thinking about you, honey. I mean, when it comes to the future, I, I try to save, don't I? How can you save what you haven't got? Look, as far as I'm concerned, you're the only woman in the world who ever meant anything to me. I, I proved that last year when I took out that $30,000 insurance, didn't I? So what? I can't carry so much insurance without borrowing. But, but I'm doing it just for you. Just so... Just, just so you'll be okay in case something happens to me. <laughs> that 30000 is doing me a lot of good as long as the company keeps me. Oh, for the love of Mike. What do you want me to do? Jump out of a window so you can collect the dough? Open it before you jump. The glass is expected. Why, you little... Go on, hit me. And you'll be sending me alimony checks from the city jail. Okay. Okay, if that's how you want it, let, let's call it a day. That suits me. I, I was a sep to think we'd get along in the first place. You haven't got a heart, you got a, you got a cash register. Your, your brain works like a slot machine. Then find someone else. I'm not so hard to look at. I'll get by. If I ever thought I'd find you with another guy, I... I oh. oh. <laughs> Charlie? <gasps> Charlie, what's the matter? Oh, help. Help me to a church. Charlie. Oh, it's well, a... Here, here. Uh, here, Charlie. I... Oh, am I... Oh, my chest. Oh, call it, Dr. Hazel. Call it. Charlie. Charlie! Today's old today. Well, you're feeling better, Mr. Gifford? Yeah, I... I feel okay now, Doc. What, uh... What happened to me? Well, it's one of those things I'm afraid I... Uh, <clears throat> Here, Mrs. Gifford, if you come inside with me, I'll give you a prescription to be filled. All right, Doctor. Mrs. Gifford, he is to remain in bed for the next four weeks. Under no circumstances is he to be allowed to leave. Doctor, what's the matter with him? I didn't want to tell him myself. I thought you could manage it better, being his wife. Uh, he has a very rare heart condition that is extremely dangerous. It was only a miracle that saved him this time. But, but he's always been healthy. Perhaps. He seems to be the excitable type, however. <clears throat> uh, what is his uh, home life like, if I may ask? Why, 
Why, Doctor, Charlie and I are like a couple of turtle doves. You never saw two people who got along the way we do. Has he been uh, worrying about his work? Oh, no. No financial troubles? Financial troubles? Oh, my goodness, we never talk about money. Charlie does all right at his job, and I'm a simple girl with simple tastes. I stand behind him and encourage him as much as I can, of course. But I'd be satisfied if he only made half of what he does now. Well, in any case, the important thing is to keep him happy and quiet. Now don't let him get a chance to upset himself in any way. And give him all the affection he wants, Mrs. Gifford. He needs affection now. Poor Charlie. Remember, the next attack may be his last. He may go on for years, though, if he's careful and he takes it easy. <clears throat> I'll have this prescription filled. He's to have one if he shows any symptoms of another attack. Yes, Doctor. And take good care of him now. I needn't repeat how serious his condition is. Oh, incidentally, uh, no overeating and no alcoholic liquors of any kind. That is important, too. I'll watch him, Doctor. Yes, lots of rest, relaxation, no worries... Oh, I'll make sure he's all right. I'll read to him and everything. And I promise I won't let him out of that bed for four weeks. Good girl. Thanks for coming, Doctor. Not at all. Good night. Good night. Hazel! Hazel! I... I'm coming. Where's the doctor? Did he leave? Just now. Well, what's the matter with me? Why didn't he tell me? There was nothing to tell you, Charlie. Charlie, you're perfectly all right. I am? Really? Sure. Sure, the doctor said you could get out of bed and do whatever you like. You just have a good time, he told me. Forget your troubles. And the sky's the limit. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I never danced so hard in all my life. Uh, you tired? <laughs> a little. Uh, how do you feel? Well, I never felt better. Really? Sure. Why? Oh, I... I was just thinking that after all, we're not as young as we used to be. Oh, I am, baby. All right. Then let's make a night of it, Charlie. We'll do the town at the morning. Well, that, that, that might be kind of expensive. Oh, don't be like that, sweetness. Just this once. Well, okay, just this once. We'll check out of this place right after this dance. <laughs> All over on the corner, driver. That's it. <laughs> oh, Charlie, you sure? Uh, so much drinking doesn't make you sick. Uh, I never felt better my whole life. <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on, Charlie. Yeah. How'd you get there? Uh, oh, sweet home. <laughs> oh. oh, thanks, Charlie. Here, here, keep keep the change, driver. Hey, what are you looking at, darling? You uh you sure you're all right? Sure, absolutely. Oh. Well uh, let's go upstairs. I was drunk last night, drunk the night before. I'm gonna get drunk uh, again. Charlie, Charlie. What, what was the matter? The, uh, the elevator isn't working. Well, who says it isn't? The super told me it was going to be closed tonight for repairs. <laughs> Come on. We'll have to walk. Well, six flights. Well, I'll race you up, Charlie. Come on. Come on, catch me, Charlie. Come on. Okay. Charlie. Come on. Here I come. Charlie. <laughs> Hello? 
Hazel, baby? Uh-huh. Look, I'll, I'll be a little late today at the office, honey. I just wanted you to know. Oh. Oh, then why don't I meet you downtown? For what? Well, we could have a nice big dinner and and then take in the fights and a couple of nightclubs. The fights? I thought you hated the fights. They're exciting, aren't they? Well, and how? Well, well, that's what I like these days, Charlie. Well, oh, fine. I'll get two tickets. All right. Oh, oh, Charlie, the doorbell's ringing. I'd better hang on. Well, meet me at the office at 7, honey. I'll be there at 7 sharp. Good evening, Mrs. Gifford. Oh. Good evening, Doctor. Come in. You haven't called me about another visit, but I thought I'd make one on my own just to see how my patient was getting well, he, on. He, he's not here, Doctor. Oh, he's not? Uh, well, I know you said he shouldn't leave his bed, but I thought that Florida would be so much better for him, and... And I, and I got a private ambulance to take him to the station and everything. Oh, he's uh, down there now? Yes, with his grandmother, Doctor. Mm -hmm. Oh, she's a loving old soul who understands, Charlie. And she'll take wonderful care of him, and I'm going to join him later. She'll put him under the care of another doctor down there. Oh, I see. Well, then I'll let his present position take over from here on. Er, uh, you told him about Charlie's condition, of course. Oh, of course, yes. And the doctor is a specialist in that sort of thing. Good. Of course, I wouldn't have advised you to move him if you had consulted me. But as long as you've gotten him down there safely, he's all right. I've been so very careful about poor Charlie. I've, I've kept him on his diet, and I haven't let him move a single finger since his attack. Oh, <laughs> You know, he, he complains that I'm being too sacrificing in the things I do for him. Oh, but I don't listen to him. I'm glad he's in such excellent hands, Mrs. Gifford. Oh, why shouldn't he be, Doctor? After all, I, I only have one husband. Well, thank you for coming, Doctor. No trouble at all. Good night, Mrs. Gifford. Good night. <laughs> Man is made of stern and solid stuff, and his body can take a beating for quite a while. From the time he is born until he reaches old age, he must resist the elements and disease in order to keep alive. And in some unfortunate cases, he is also forced to resist the diabolical impulses of a homicidal wife. I'm home. I said I'm home, baby. Who cares? What? What's the matter? Oh, nothing. Well, dinner ready? No. Well, when will it be ready? You wouldn't want to hang that long. Say, what's got into you, honey? All you ever think about is food. You should have married a cafeteria, not a woman. But all I want is dinner, Hazel. I... Look, I... I thought we were through with fights. What's the big idea? Oh, drop dead. Y okay, that's the kind of mood you're in. I won't argue with you. Why, you dumb... <laughs> oh. All right. Let's forget about it. I apologize. Now you sound more like my baby. Oh, oh, Joey Wilson called me in the office today. He wants me to do a little bowling with him tonight. At what time? Well, I'm meeting him at 8. That is... That is if it's all right with you. What time will you be home? Oh, by 10, sure. Oh, well, have fun, Charlie. It's just fine with me. <clears throat> Give me a beer, bartender. I'm sorry. No ladies allowed in the bar without gents. Wow. You are a gent, aren't you? I'm walking here. That's all right. You be my escort. <laughs> well, as long as you put it that way. Here's your beer. Will you have one with me? Well, don't mind if I do. <sighs> Here's luck. You betcha. Oh, my goodness. What's the matter? 
I've got to run my stocking. Hmm? Look. Uh, wait, uh, don't spoil the shape of your gamps, none. <laughs> You're cute. Yeah. What's your name? Axel. My real name's Axel Rudd, but everybody calls me Axel. That's a nice name. Mine's Hazel. Axel. Hazel. They rhyme, you know. Yeah. Say, <laughs> 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 Hazel, you live around here? Well, not far away. Alone? Uh-huh. And I'd get relieved early tonight. How's about the day? Well, that all depends. On what? What time you're off? Ten o'clock. Ten? Couldn't you make it 9.30? What's a half hour between friends? Well, I'd hate to sit there in my little house all by myself. And if you could get there by 9.30, I'd have some sandwiches ready and some beer. You mean you're inviting me up? Well, Natch. Oh, boy, I'd get hold of the other barkeep, baby, and have him get here earlier. I'll give you my address. And see you later. Okay. Uh, how much do I owe you for the beer, Axel? Never mind, sugar. This one's on me. Were the sandwiches good, Axel? Oh, say, they hit the spot. Well, what time is it? Uh, five after ten. I just can't understand it. You can't understand what? That, <laughs> that time flies so fast when I'm with you. <sighs> Sit over here next to me. Oh, you don't have to ask me twice. Mm, you're so strong. I'll bet you've got a terrific punch. Oh, I do my own bouncing at that gin mill. Suppose, uh, suppose a man walked in here and interrupted us. Man? What kind of man? Some pest. He's been bothering me for weeks, and and I can't get rid of him. A measure? Oh, he's worse than that. His name is Charlie, and I'm terribly afraid of him. You expect him over tonight? Uh-huh. Just wait till he gets here, honey. I'll kick his teeth out. You do that. I'll get rid of him, baby, once and for all. That's just what I'm hoping for. <laughs> Hello? Hazel? Yes. Where are you? Oh, I'm still at the bowling alley. I, uh, I won't be home till morning, honey. You what? Well, Joey got hit with a ball. We're taking him to the hospital. Well, you see, he's, he's my pal, Hazel, and I want to stay with him till I'm sure he's okay. How can a man get hit with a bowling ball? Well, you see, it was like this. The, the joint is short of pin boys, so Joey said oh, that he would go... Oh, stay out for the rest of the week for all I care. Who's that? Hazel, like... What? I said... Who? Take those big feet of yours off my couch. Huh? Put your coat on and get out of here. I'm sick of looking at you. But honey... Don't honey me, you overfed skin full of beer. Get out. Get out. on some odds and ends. Say, you're out of breath. Am I? Yeah. You look like you've been sawing a hunk of wood. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Hey, listen, honey, I, I got a swell idea. Instead of eating at home, let's have dinner downtown and take in a show. Well, uh, all right, Charlie. I say, uh, isn't it chilly inside the house? Chilly? Well, I don't notice it. Before we leave, maybe you'd better check the furnace in the cellar? Oh, it'll wait till I come back. Do it now. Well, what's the hurry? We'll be out all evening. Is that all I get out of you when I ask for one measly little favor? Don't you ever think of anything but yourself? 
Oh, honey, let's not start all over again. You are treating me like an Indian squaw. I've got a right to some consideration, too. Cut it out, will you? Cut it out! That's the first time I ever let myself lose my temper since the day I got sick. Well, what do you want me to do about it? Kiss your foot? Hazel, I, I tried. I, I tried like crazy, but it's no go. What do you mean? Well, for a while, though, I, I, I thought we were going to get along. I thought it was going to be like the old days. But you just won't leave me alone. you got to pick and pick until you drive me off my nut. Well, what happens now? Well, I think we ought to call it quits. Really? I'm going to get out, Hazel. That's all there is to it. You just try it, Charlie. It'll cost you plenty. Yeah? I'll squeeze you so hard the alumine will come right out of your ears. That's what you think, but I got different For plans. Instance... A man's got a right to live, hasn't he? Nobody could get along with you. And any judge will back me up. No, no, he won't. Money, money, money. That's all you got on your silly mind. You, you, you're just a, a lazy, trembled, and itchy paw. Who do you think you're talking I'm to? I'm talking to my wife. My, my sweet, agreeable, lousy, tempered wife. And, sister, I'm getting rid of her in court just as fast as I can find a lawyer. I'll make you pay, Charlie. I'll make you pay right through the nose. I wouldn't give you a wooden nickel. I'm through, baby, and that's final. Now, where's my suitcase? How do I know? Yeah, oh, yeah, I remember. It's in the cellar. Get out of my way. Come on. The cellar? Now, don't try to stop me, Hazel. I made up my mind. I... I won't try to stop you, Charlie. You'll find your bag downstairs. Here's the first. Yeah, I should have done this long ago. Yes. Yeah, you should have. Go on, Charlie. Go into the cellar and get your suitcase. Go on! <laughs> roll! Roll down on your fat head! Roll, Charlie! Roll! <laughs> That feel better, Mr. Gifford? I uh, yeah. Yeah, thanks, Doc. Well, one of the neighbors called me when she heard the noise. Your arm will be all right in a week or so. It's just a sprain. And those bruises will heal in no time. You were lucky to come out so safely after a fall like that. Yeah. I was lucky. I also crawled over and took a look at those busted stairs before I passed out. Seems to me I got a little account to settle with my love and wife. Come on, Doc. Help me out of the cell to the living room. Just Come a on. minute, Charlie. I suppose there's no point in hiding it from you any longer, although I wish I could in your condition. Hiding what, Doc? I, uh, I found your wife at the head of the stairs when I came in. You... You, you found her? She was lying on the floor. She's, uh, dead, Charlie. On the level, Doc? It's just one of those things that you have to face. She must have been a very nervous woman, on edge all the time. Or else she was under a great strain recently. What? What do you mean? Unfortunately, my first diagnosis seems to indicate that she died of a heart attack. Let's check over the events of the last half hour. You remember the bank thief in Hong Kong I told you about? Well, he was shot to death when he was caught in the act. The Hollywood movie actress has taken her screen test and her potential producer is reserving a table for two at the Macombo in order to become better acquainted. The gentleman in Peoria who invented the mousetrap has overcome his disappointment and is now on the verge of inventing something bigger and better in the way of a trap for rats. And at this very moment, a man named Charlie Gifford is making plans to spend a winter of rest and relaxation on the shores of Miami Beach. With the aid of a $10,000 life insurance policy left to him by his lately lamented and loving wife, Hazel. The Clock will be heard next week, same time. It's written by Lawrence Clee and stars Hart McGuire as The Clock. Tonight you heard Wendy Playfair as Hazel and Leon Pierce as Charlie with Edward Howell and Owen Weingott. The Clock, directed by John Saul.
Sunrise and sunset. Promise and fulfillment. Birth and death. The whole drama of life is written in the sands of time. We present a new series of radio programs, The Clock. How many stories have you heard that began with the words, once upon a time? Hundreds of them, perhaps, when you were younger, and when the hours of your life passed by in a more leisurely pace. You'd huddle in the big easy chair by the fire, while the old grandfather clock ticked the minutes away in a reassuring, monotonous, and soothing fashion. Your narrator would tell you a frightening tale of beauty and the beast. Then you'd scurry off to bed, happily secure in the knowledge that they lived happily ever after. Well, I have a story for you tonight that begins with Once Upon a Time. And, in a way, it's a modern version of Beauty and the Beast or Lady Bountiful. But I'm afraid that I am unable to guarantee that they lived happily ever after. The idea is ridiculous, naturally. But why? It's too dangerous, that's why. Oh, how can it be dangerous to want to help someone? But you can't just go into the street and pick up any old trap. It's fantastic. Eve. Do you know how unhappy I've been since Ralph died? But what's your husband got to do with it? A great deal. He needed me while he was alive. He needed me badly. I don't say I was responsible for his success, but I do know I gave him inspiration. And that was what I lived for, Eve, when Ralph was with me. Uh, I suppose you consider yourself one of those women who has to mother every male in sight. Not really. What are you going to do? Just wander along somewhere until you find some filthy drunk to reclaim? Why not? Weakness isn't a crime. When a man's down and out, there must be a reason for it. And it may only take a few pounds and a little kind advice to straighten him out. Where on earth did you get this idea, Natalie? I saw in the papers today about some poor soul picked up in the street, an unidentified man who died of malnutrition. And chronic alcoholism? No, that isn't true. He hadn't been drinking. Anyway, I don't intend to look for an alcoholic. There are doctors and hospitals for those. All I want to do is find one man who needs my help. And do what I can for him. And what will that get you? I... I want to feel the way I felt when Ralph would come to me for advice. When he'd depend on me. And when do you intend to go on this hunt for the lost soul? This evening. You're mad, Natalie. You're just looking for someone to clout you over the head and take your purse. You needn't come with me. Natalie, for heaven's sake, forget it. I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll dine at Louis, then go to a show. There's a musical I'm dying to see. I've made up my mind, Eve. I'm going through with this. Will you come with me? Oh, all right. I may as well. At least I'll be around to identify your body. What a neighborhood. Couldn't you pick a street with lights? There's a little park over there, Eve, with some benches. Let's sit down for a while. I'd give anything for a cocktail. Eve. What? Look. Lying on that bench. Yes, dear. It's a man. His face covered with newspaper. I'm going over to talk to him. Now, wait. Let me get a police. No. Do you want to frighten him? Look at the way he's lying there. How can you be afraid of a human being who's so pitiful? So close to being completely broken. Oh, all right. Give him some money and let's get out of here. You stay here, Eve. Natalie! Uh, are you awake? Yeah, I'm awake. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to disturb you. Oh, that's all right, lady. What do you want? Uh, well, I... I, I... I just want to help you. Yeah? I'll give you some money if you promise to use it in the way I suggest. <clears throat> yeah. How much? What? Well, I said, how much do you want to give me? Oh, well, how much do you need? Do you think you can buy a good suit of clothes for 
15 or 20 pounds. I have 30 here that I... Uh, let's see. Uh, <clears throat> three tens. Will you... Will you use it to give yourself another chance to live like a decent human being? I really want to help you in other ways. If you'll just be honest with me. I can get you a job and I can... Wait. Uh, here. This is my card. Tomorrow morning, when you feel better, come over to my home and I'll make inquiries about a position for you. What's your name? Pike. Is, is that your last or your first name? It's my only name. Oh. Uh, well, you, you have some money now. I, I expect you'll really make some good use of it. Yeah. Yeah, I'll make good use of it. Good night, Mr. Pike. Good night, lady. To death. What did he say? Nothing. I, I saw you give him some money. Didn't he even thank you? No. Why, dear? Quick. Well, there you have it, Joan of Arc. Now you see how far kindness will get you. <laughs> Maybe you were right, Eve. He really didn't seem very impressed. I probably won't ever see him again. Now will you forget this idiotic notion of yours? All right. I feel better about it anyway. At least I tried. Where is he? Is he gone? No. He's just standing there, staring at us. Come on, Natalie, let's get out of here. Oh. It's you. Yeah, laddie. Me. Uh, come in, Pike. You gave me your card. I know. <laughs> but you don't look very glad to see me. Glad? Hmm. <laughs> That's a funny word to use, Pike. Frankly, I didn't think you'd show up. Ah, but I'm here. Yes, you're here. What you looking at, lady? Your clothes. They're the same ones you had on last night. And you haven't even shaved. <laughs> it ain't Saturday yet. Saturday? Hmm. Only seven Saturday. Oh, you could at least have bought yourself some second-hand clothes. Uh, the ones I got on are okay. Did you spend the money I gave you? Well, <clears throat> I used it to pay some debts. Oh, well, that's something anyway. When a man turns over a new leaf, it's always a good idea to clear himself of his obligations. I got into a poker game last night. I lost. Then my debts I paid. Oh. Then why did you come here? You didn't do as I asked, didn't you? I came for some more money. More money? I need some more. Now, just a second, Pike. Let's understand each other. I have no intention of giving you money to gamble with. <laughs> I won't gamble. I placed my faith in you last night, and you've disappointed me terribly. I'd rather not let myself in for another disappointment. But I need some money, lady. You can get yourself a job and earn some. I'll call a friend of mine, if you like, and see if he can... I don't want a job. I, I want money. Well, you're not going to get any from me. Now, please leave. I have an appointment downtown. What's in there? In where? Oh, oh clothes, there. of course. Where are you going? How dare you? What's these men's suits doing in here? They belong to my husband. Now, will you please... Is he dead? Yes. <laughs> Just my size. Oh, this brown one's nice. Take your hands off that suit. Oh, why don't you give it to me? Of course not. It's a nice suit. Only thing I have left to remind. Oh, why am I talking to you like this? It's none of your affair. Put the suit back and leave, please. Ah, oh, you wouldn't miss it, lady. The guy's dead, so he don't need it. Are you going, or must I call the police? Won't you give me that suit? Oh, all right, take it. Take it and go. <laughs> the good suit. I'll drop you. This cab's on me for a change. It's been a lovely afternoon. I haven't been to the museum in ages. I'm afraid we're becoming a couple of lowbrows, Natalie. 
Really, we ought to be intellectual a little more often. <laughs> I guess you're right. Oh, by the way, I meant to ask you, you never heard for that raggedy tramp you helped last week? What made you ask that? No, oh, I just wondered if he ever tried to follow you up for another touch. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I, uh, I saw him the next day, but it was only for a moment. I, um, I gave the poor fellow a suit of Ralph's clothes. But what about that money? Oh, it doesn't matter, Eve. He's gone now. I haven't seen him since then, and it's been almost a week. I'm sure I'll never hear from him again. Driver, stop on this corner, please. But you're several blocks from home. Oh, I have some shopping to do. I'm dining in tonight for a change, all by myself. I haven't cooked a meal since... Well, since Ralph was with me. I'm going to spend a nice, quiet evening at home. Come to say hello. How did you get in? The door was open. It wasn't open. I just unlocked it myself. What you got in those packages? Food. Let's see. Mm -hmm. <laughs> ah, it's taken. Like a pie. <laughs> Looks good. What's this? That's an avocado pear. What? Now, if you know what's good for you, you'll march right out of that door and leave this neighborhood as fast as you can. I never tasted an avocado. Did you hear what I said? I'll leave, lady, right after we have, uh, right after we have some dinner. species has its own particular life cycle, and they greatly vary in length of time. It is said that the sea turtle can live more than 200 years, and the elephant can go beyond the century mark. Man has given his three score and ten, and when we come to the insects at the bottom of the scale, we find they complete their lives in a single season. There is one species of life, however, that depends upon a host in order to exist. It is known as the leech, and it seems to me it might be logical to assume that the length of life this creature can look forward to depends in part upon how much blood he can squeeze from his victim. I'll take another cup of coffee. You've had two cups already. One more, Lee. Why don't you go? What are you waiting for? You've sponged a meal, now leave me alone. Pass the sugar. Do you know what I'm going to do if you don't stop annoying me? I'm going to call the police. I'll have you arrested and they'll put you in jail. Pass the cream. What are you trying to do to me? Why do you keep following me this way? It's the first time I've lost my temper in years. And it's your fault. You got any money on your lady? I've given you money. I need some more. I gave you money and I gave you a suit. What did you do with the suit? You're not wearing it. I hocked it. It was a good suit. They gave me 15 quid. You're a parasite. You're like some horrible thing that attaches itself to your skin and you can't get rid of it. <laughs> You've got nice skin, lady. Take your hand off my arm. Hmm. Pink skin. I like pink skin. If, if I give you some money, will you go away and never come back? How much? I've got 20 pounds in my bag. Take it. For the heaven's sake, don't come back here anymore. Let me have it. Here. Now get out. That was a nice dinner, lady. And will you stop calling me lady? I happen to have a name. Yeah, it was a nice dinner. Only, uh, <clears throat> next time, don't forget the toothpicks. <laughs> Didn't you tell me you were going away for a few weeks? Why, yes. I'm going to visit my sister. When are you leaving? Tomorrow. Eve, Eve, would you do me a great favor? Of course. I'll never forget you for this, Eve. If only you'll say yes. Please, don't refuse me. Italy, darling, you sound just awful. 
I never refuse you anything. You know that. I want to move into your flat until you get back. Is that all? Oh, you don't know what this means to me, Eve. It, it, Darling, it, it, calm yourself. What on earth is the trouble? Oh, it, it doesn't matter. I, I'll explain some other time. I've got to get out of this house, that's all. And I've got to get out immediately. You can move in in the morning, Natalie. Oh, thank you, Eve. Thank you. You're sure you'll be all right now? Yes, I, I'll be fine, Eve. And uh, you still don't want to tell me what the trouble is? Oh, well, the whole thing's so, so ridiculous. I, I'm ashamed of myself. I'm just acting like a frightened child. By the time you come back, I'll have sold my home and bought another. And... Oh, you're going to sell that pretty house and buy a new one. Yes, and but the way the prices are these days, you'll never get anything. Oh, else. Eve, let me handle this, please. Look. You'd better hurry or you'll miss your plane. You'll be comfortable here. And I'll write to you. All right, Eve. Bye now. <laughs> Goodbye and have a nice trip. Thanks. Careful. So it'll lock the door. You can never tell about burglars. How did you find out where I was? I followed you. What do you want? I've given you money and clothes. What are you after me for? Oh, please, please don't do this to me. What have I done to you? Why do you torture me this way? Please, I beg of you, leave me alone. <laughs> <laughs> You look better when you cry than most women do when they laugh. If, if you try to stop me leaving, I, I'll get out of my way. No, just a minute, lady. Just a minute. Get out of just my way. Yes, ma'am? Sergeant, Sergeant, my name is Williams. Mrs. Natalie Williams. I live on Parker Drive. Yes, ma'am. And there's a man. A man. I can't get rid of him. He's been following me for weeks. You've got to do something. You've got to help me. He's been molesting him? Well, he, he keeps coming to my house and asking for things. I'm terribly afraid of him. Now, just a second, lady. Take it easy. Do you know this fellow? His name is Pike. Where did you meet him in the first place? Well, I... I... I gave him money. You what? I gave him some money. He was on a park bench and I... I, I wanted to help him. You mean you picked him up? Oh, no, no, I only wanted to help him. I, I wanted to do something for someone, and I... So you started a conversation with a stranger and gave him money? Oh, you, you, you don't understand. What else did you give him? What? Why, a, a, a suit of clothes. He belonged to my husband. Okay, he... lady. You better be on your way. Oh, what is the matter with you? Why won't you give me protection? Protection from what? Spike! Has he threatened you? Oh, no, no, he hasn't. Hasn't made any threats. Is it he... a case of assault and battery, maybe? Did he hit you? No, no, he, he never... Did he steal anything from you? No, but it's worse than that. Is it? It, it, it is... It's what? Oh, you, you don't believe me, do you? Yes, I believe you, lady. You picked up a tramp and gave him clothes and money. He doesn't touch you and he doesn't steal from you. So now I'm supposed to slap him in jail. On what charge, may I ask? <laughs> You'll kill me if you don't help me. My advice to you, lady, is to meet your boyfriends at bridge parties and not on park benches. Wait a minute. I want you to talk to somebody. Who? There's a doctor inside. You don't look so good. Maybe you need a little stick. <gasps> now you think I'm crazy. Look, let's just take it easy. Oh! Hey, come back. Come back here. May I help you, madam? Do you sell guns here? Uh, hunting guns, yes, madam. Give me one. What kind, please? What kind have you got? Well, we have rifles for duck shooting and larger models for bigger game. Let me see a larger model. Very well. Uh, this is the Mannlicker, point two five six, used for big game mostly, leopards and lions. And, and this one? Well, this is the most powerful model we have. It's a point four five zero high velocity job. Got to kick like a mule and stop a mad elephant at one hundred yards. I'll take it. You must be going after dangerous game. Yes, I'm. I'm going after the most 
dangerous game of all. Come in. Come in, Pike. I want to see you. Come in! Natalie! Oh, oh, oh. It's you. What on earth are you doing with that ugly looking rifle? Why did you come home, Eve? My plane was grounded. Natalie, what's going on here? Why are you pointing that gun at the door? I'm. I'm waiting for a visitor. Natalie, for heaven's sake! Don't fear, Eve. It's either him or me. I know why he follows me. Now he wants my life. He's got everything else, and now he wants my life. Give me that gun, Natalie. Don't touch me. Your ear, your ear, darling. Oh, please listen to reason. Give me the gun. I'm going to sit here until he walks inside that door. And but then I'll pull the trigger. Who are you talking about? Pike. Pike. The tramp. The parasite. I can't wait any longer. I've got to get him now before he gets me. But that murder. It's self-defense. Oh, don't you see what you're doing? Oh, darling, you're so ill. Let me call the doctor. Sit down, Eve. Natalie, sit down and don't interfere. <gasps> oh, Natalie, open the door for him, Eve. Natalie, with a lot of... Open the door, I said. Then stand aside. I won't. I won't open it. It's open. Come in. Natalie, don't... What's the big idea, lady? Here, give me I... that gun. Uh... Yeah, this is some cannon. It's, it's a hunting gun, Sergeant. What were you expecting to walk through that door? A rhinoceros? Oh, we're, we're planning a hunting trip. Um, aren't we, Natalie? We're going to Africa or, or to India or somewhere. And You, and... Mrs. Natalie William? Uh, yes. You're the lady who came into the station a few hours ago. Yes, I am. Hmm. I got some news for you, lady. But I'm not sure as how I ought to yank you in on suspicion. Now, now, officer, this woman is a friend of mine. I can provide character witnesses for her. Now, look, officer, I see no reason why we can't clean a rifle in my own home. It's a hunting gun and we weren't concealing anything. All right, all right. Stop chewing my ear off. Sergeant, you, you, you said you had news for me. Yes. A fellow named Pike fell in front of a train half an hour ago. He had no identification on him except this card with your name on it. It is yours, isn't it? Yes, I, uh, I gave it to him. Well, he's dead now, poor fellow. A more harmless-looking guy I never saw. Looked like he wouldn't hurt a fly. Just a tramp was all he was. A down and outer. What in the name of all that's sensible made you think he was bad? I... I don't know. Now that... He's gone. I don't know. Catch her, Sergeant. She's fainting. <laughs> Easy, lady. Oh. Maybe, maybe the, the joke's on me. Oh, yes. Maybe, maybe, maybe he was harmless after all. <laughs> Cowper, the poet, might have ended the story with a couplet such as this. Fancy, like the finger of a clock, runs the great circuit and is still at home. The clock will be heard again next week, same time. This program was written by Lawrence Clee with Hart McGuire as the clock. You heard Marie Clark as Natalie and Ozzie Wenburn as Pike with Muriel Steinbeck and Gordon Glenwright. The clock directed by John Saul, is a Grace Gibson radio production. Sunrise and sunset, promise and fulfillment, birth and death. The whole drama of life is written in the sands of time. We present a new series of radio programs, The Clock.
Nobody, but nobody will sell you a car for less than Don Richards Lincoln Mercury. And especially during grand opening sale time. We've done it again just in time for a grand opening, purchasing another 10 1969 Mercury's Coupe four-door hardtops. Loaded with power steering, power brakes, automatic transmissions. All have factory air conditioning. They carry the balance of the 50,000 mile or five-year warranty. Property taxes are paid, too. And priced at a low, $25.95. While you're at Don Richards Lincoln Mercury, see the fantastic 1971 sexy German import Capri. Economical to buy and operate. And selling for under $2,300. Remember, nobody but nobody sells for less. According to some, there are two worlds of existence. One we call the earthbound, the other, the spirit world. For those who are here on earth, time is limited. For those who inhabit the spirit realm, time is limitless. And there is a definite link between the upper strata and the lower. A link that can be bridged in the space of a few moments by those who have the power to do so. Now, I can't argue pro or con concerning this belief. Time is an observer, not a contestant. But whether you are skeptical or not, you might lend an ear to the saga of a man named Marty Kane, and then form your own conclusions. Thanks a lot for picking me up, mister. It's getting dark out there. People ain't so cordial when the sun goes down. I wasn't afraid of you, young man. Not after I felt your vibration. You... My what? Your vibration. Your cosmic emanation. Oh. Yeah? Do you know what I mean? Well, I do. Don't make no difference. I ain't touchy. Every one of us gives off vibration. That's how we're able to make contact with the spirit world. Are you kidding? You must be skeptical. Most uninformed people are. Uh, what is your name, young man? Marty Kane. And mine is Leon. Leon what? Two names are unimportant. It is enough that the spirit of my father's will recognize one. Tell me, young man, are you employed? I'm on my own. What sort of work do you do? Anything that pays. Right now, I'm just a tramp. I admire your frankness. I also feel you might be helpful in my work. You know, what kind of work? I'm a medium. I provide a link between those who are earthbound and those who occupy the spirit world. You don't say. I communicate with what you skeptics call the dead. Although, of course, there are no dead. Well, Louis would be tickled to hear that. Who is Louis? A uh, pal of mine. He fell into a cement mixer and they had to pour him through a net to find him. If Louis wasn't dead, then I'll eat this jalopy and I'll start right now with the mudguard. It is odd how a man with your vibrations can lack such understanding. If my vibrations don't like it, they can hang on to someone else. But I feel I can change you. After a while. At any rate, I'm in need of an assistant. Would you like the job? What do I do? Oh, See that my guests are properly seated during the film. Take care of my car. Run errands occasionally. It, it isn't an executive position, so to speak, but you will find it interesting. Well, that don't sound bad. There is only one thing I must insist on, however. Yeah, what's that? Sooner or later you'll be converted. However, until that time, you are to keep your opinions concerning my work to yourself. I cannot afford any ridicule from an employee. Oh, don't worry about it, Leon. I'll keep my shirt on. And, uh, whenever you want me to, uh... <laughs> For rattle a couple of chains, just say the word. We drove right to his home. It was a big wooden building that was falling apart at the seams, and it reminded me of a three-story morgue. Uh, this is where I hold my seances. Uh, looks cozy. Of course, the word seance is a ridiculous term. But we use it because it seems to be in the fashion. You mind uh, if I ask you a question, Leon? Not at all. You really got ghosts in here that talk to your pals? They talk through me, Marty, using my voice. And the spirit world young man is far wiser than our own. Suppose I want to talk to Louis. Could you get him down? Louis? You're the guy who fell into the cement mixer. I might try. <laughs> Something amuses me? <laughs> yes, I was just thinking. Maybe instead of getting Louis down, you'd have to bring him up. <laughs> you shall see tonight how a seance works. Perhaps tomorrow you'll be less cynical. Oh, Gertrude... I want you to be my new assistant. Marty, this is my very lovely wife. Lovely was right. Gertrude was slightly terrific. She had long, wavy red hair that fell down to her shoulders. 
and the skin you love to touch. When she walked, she swayed a little, and there wasn't a misplaced curve from her black nylon stockings to the velvet choker she wore around her pretty throat. And Gertrude was quite a dish. A seven-course dinner with nothing but dessert. And I could see she was looking me over, too. Marty used to be my new assistant. You will please share his duties, Gertrude. Anything you say, Anne, darling. I have to make my phone calls now. This hour's tonight will begin at nine. And before you show him round, you might give him some lunch, my dear. And then you may join me upstairs. Hungry? Not now. Why not now? Not since I met you. You work pretty fast. Well. I ain't got much time. Where'd you come from? Uh, the spirit world. I'm looking for somebody to haunt. Well, don't try me. I've had enough of that apple sauce already. You mean you ain't a medium, too? I'm just bored. I want to communicate with a man for a change. Not with a nut that's halfway between here and who knows where. You're a strong talk to a guy you only met two minutes ago. You won't repeat it. No? No. Uh, how long how long have you been married to this girl? Six months. You're tired of them already? It makes me sick. And where do you hang around? I like to eat. Dame with your looks can eat whenever she wants. Not the way I like to eat. You've got cash? There's no money in there, but he does pretty well. The racket pays off. A hundred a week. Hey, that's nice lettuce. Why does he live in this drafty dump? It gives him background. Besides, you like it. You don't believe in this malarkey about the spirits, huh? To me, it's just nonsense. But he believes it. Nah. I tell him he does. There's something peculiar about him when he goes in one of his trances. He thinks he's someone else. He swallows his own crazy line. I'm looking forward to seeing it. You will, tonight. You'll be seeing so much of it after a while it'll make you sick in the stomach. Huh. But that's something I wouldn't say, baby, about you. At nine bells, the suckers trail in. There were half a dozen dames, rest for gents. They sat around the circle with Leon at one end, and they watched him like a bunch of hungry cats would watch a bowl of cream. But it was Gertie who surprised me. She played it straight. So straight that I had to think back to remember what she... what she was really like. I believe we're ready. Are you prepared, Leon? Yes. <laughs> I'll do my best to establish communication tonight. Although one never knows, of course, when one is able to contact the spirit world at any given moment. Mr. Kane? Huh? Will you put out the light? Yeah, oh, sure. I just need the little one burning over the door. There's no need to be in total darkness. Are you ready, Leon? The room was almost dark because the light we left on was covered with colored paper. But I could see him anyway, rubbing his hands over his fat little face. Then suddenly he straightened out and started to sway back and forth. And the jerk was in his trance. We of the spirit world are continually by your side. We watch your every move, and we in our infinite wisdom know everything and see all. We will talk with you now, and we will try to identify ourselves. Who wishes to converse with us? Speak now, please. Speak up. Is, uh, is my brother among you? Your brother. Ah, my friend, there are so many here tonight. We shall see if we can find your brother. I... I lost him years ago in an accident. Harry. Harry, talk to me if you hear me. Tell me you're well and happy. Harry is well. Yes, he is very well. And he is happier than you are, my friend. He conveys this message to you. He tells you to work hard and be patient until the time when you shall meet again. Oh, if I could just be sure. Of what, my friend? Of whether it's really Harry I'm talking to. You do not believe. Who do you think that? It's just that... But there may be someone else in the spirit world who's speaking for Harry. Harry, do you hear your brother speaking? Assure him of your presence. Assure him that we are all here. There's a globe. Near the window. It's my brother. It's Harry! Up to this point, I was watching the old fake of shimmy from foot to foot, but... When one of the customers pointed to the window, I saw it. A soft glow near the ceiling that passed across the window and disappeared. Later, when the suckers left, I was alone with Leon for a minute. 
He looked at me with a peculiar smile as I emptied out the ashtrays, and he seemed to read my mind. Well, young man, what did you think of the show? Well, I, uh... I still ain't convinced. You saw the light, didn't you? Yeah, sure. It could have been made by headlight reflections from a passing car. How do you mean? Well, go to bed some night and keep watching the window when there's traffic outside in the street. You'll see them headlights passing like... Look, look, there goes one now. Yes, there's our car lights. But that isn't what you saw this evening. No? What you saw was the partial materialization of a psychic phenomenon. You saw a member of the world that is not of the flesh. Yeah, that's your story. You are hard to convince. But one day I will prove myself to you and everyone else. Yeah? How? When I die. Yes. When I die, Marty, I will return. Nothing will stop me. I will return, young man, from the grave. <laughs> It resists 47 of the worst kinds of stains, like ink, paint, even grape drink. It's quality carpet, the kind usually sold to hotels, motels, theaters, restaurants exclusively because of its durability and quality. It comes with heavy-duty commercial padding, and it's laid by factory-trained carpet layers to custom-fit your rooms. I'm talking about our now-famous carpet offer at Brentwood Fine Furnishings, where we will completely install, in your own home, three rooms of carpet, all for not 300 but a low 149 The reason for the outstanding carpet offer is because of a special purchase from our factory of over $50,000 worth of this carpet, and it comes in popular modern colors as well. Not seconds, but quality carpet all the way. Yes, carpet your living room, dining room, hallway, or kitchen. All for $149. Or even a bedroom or two. Your combination of any three rooms, a big 250 square foot area for a low $149. To the first ten buyers, a bonus. Your bathroom will be carpeted free or a handsome Eureka vacuum. Call 487-3649 tomorrow. 487-3649 tomorrow. Open at 9.30 a.m. 487-3649 tomorrow. Brentwood's Fine Furnishings and Sugar House at 2112 South 11th East. One's time on Earth may be spent according to one's beliefs and inclinations. And the length of this time is a matter beyond our control. But how we use this time is something else again. For sooner or later, we must play the piper for the dance. I'm tired of it, sir. Sick and tired of it. Now take it easy, baby. You don't know what it's like to do with that sword. Look, I've taken as much as I can stand, Marty. If I have to go through this any longer, I'll go crazy. Then why don't you divorce him? And starve to death? Well, you've got me, sugar. Sure. And what have you got? Nothing but the suit of clothes on your back and a few measly banknotes on your mattress. Well, if you don't want to leave him, then stop complaining. Nobody's forcing you to stay. And you said you loved me. What's one thing going to do with another? What kind of a man are you, anyway? Do you want to go on for the rest of your life seeing me behind his back? Crawl out a cockroach every time he orders you around? Who's crawling? Nobody ever saw me crawl, and nobody will. Oh, Marty... Marty, darling, do something to make me free. What What can I do? Well, there are ways that a man can think of. What are you getting at? But if... If Leon were to die, we'd have the business. I know that by heart. And I know how to pick up the customers. What do you mean, if Leon was to die? He's also got a little money in the bank. Eight or ten thousand. That would belong to me, too. Now, wait a minute, Gertrude. It'd be easy. He's such a fool. He'd fall for anything I told him. And, and we could get away with it. Get away with what? Murder? Are you nuts? What are you saying? Look, it was only a figure of speech. What I meant was we could get away with murder by leaving him flat and helping ourselves to a little bit of cash on the floor. Not a chance. We'd be picked up in no time. Oh, you make me sick. You've got no backbone. I don't know what I see in you anyway. Oh, now, baby, don't be like that. Get your hands off me. I'm through with you, understand? I want a man, not a cream puff. I never want to see you again. Marty? Yeah, Gertrude? Marty, let's make up. Oh, gee, baby, that's, that's all I've been wanting to do. I'm sorry I was so mean to you. Will you forgive me? Sure. We'll go back to where we left off two weeks ago. Mm-hmm. Oh, I, I need to tell you we're going to town tonight. Yeah? What for? I have a cousin living there, and Leon sent us to take me over to see her. We'll use the car and you'll drive. Uh, I wish he was going by himself instead. So as you and I could be alone. We'll be alone, Marty. Yes. Very much alone. Same than you think. The way she said it bothered me for a while. But by the time we were in the car that night, I'd forgotten all about it. The quickest way to drive to Oak Town is across a long, high bridge. We reached it at 6.15. 
I was taking it easy and there wasn't much traffic, but when we hit the middle of the bridge, she suddenly asked me to stop. Well, what's the big idea? I guess we're going to show me something, Marty. Here? In the middle of the bridge? Well, we're just a moment. Come on, Leon. Let's get out of the car. Hey, now, wait a minute. What are you... What are you going to say? Gertrude tells me she's observed a manifestation from this bridge. At uh, this hour of the evening. Don't you remember, Marty, when we drove across two weeks ago? Well, I... It was in the sun, said Leon. I saw my father's face. You've got to see it with me. I've got to try to look for it again. This makes me very happy, Gertrude. Up to now, in spite of all your help, I have considered you a skeptic. I'm not anymore, Leon. Come on, darling, help me out of the car. I sat there while they both got out. I didn't say a word. He had that look on his pan that he always had when he figured he'd made a convert. And he was following it to the edge of the bridge like a scotty after a bone. I froze to my seat, watched him. I could have yelled, but the words wouldn't come. I just sat there. Saw her turn and look up and down the bridge for a passing car. Then when she saw it was empty, as the dope kept watching the sunset, she put her arm behind his back and shoved Come on, get out of here. You push. Come on, get out of here, you idiot. They found the body two days later. And Gertie put on an act that was something to see. She said he used to walk on the bridge by himself in the moonlight, communing with his great-grandfather, and he must have fallen off. There was nothing to prove that it was murder, so they called it accidental death. And Gertie and I took over the racket and started to make it really pay. Are you ready, Gertrude? I'm ready, Martin. (laughs) We of the spirit world are continually by your side. We watch your every move, and we, in our infinite wisdom, know everything and see all. We will talk with you now, and we will try to identify ourselves. Who wishes to converse with us? Speak now, please. Speak. I, uh, I'd like to hear from my brother again. Harry. Harry, talk to me if you hear me. Are you still very happy? Harry is well, but he is not very happy. He conveys this message to you. These people through whom I speak are my only means of reaching you, Charles, my loving brother. Be good to them. Help them in any way you can, so we shall never be parted. Oh, yes. Yes, of course, Harry. I'll do everything in my power to keep us close, but... But what can I do? You have money, Charles. Use it wisely. Oh, let me be certain again. Let me be sure once more that it's really Harry I'm talking to. There is no need for reassurance, Charles. You must only believe. Wait. It's there. The door in the window. It's coming. Have they gone? Yeah. <laughs> How much did he give you? A check for a hundred. Oh, baby, this racket is a cinch. We'll get triple what Leon got, and no kidding. I told you to be easy. Hey, you're a small kid, Gertrude. I've got to hand it to you. Oh, you're not so dumb yourself. That torch gag was wonderful. For a minute, I thought I was stuck. What torch gag? No, when you saw that light. You used the torch, didn't you? Oh, I didn't use nothing if there was a headlight reflection from a passing car. Passing car? Well, no, it couldn't have been. They were in the street outside. It's been closed to traffic for three days. I looked at her for a second. Then ran to the window. She was right. The street was closed. But that was only the beginning. The next time we held a seance, I kept my eyes open. Someone was pulling a fast one, and it wasn't us. But you must have... I tell you, I didn't do it. No, you did. Well, it might have been someone in the street. That sound was in the room. You heard it as well as I did. What are you doing? You're falling for that stuff yourself. He always said he'd try to come back. And if he had... Stop that. Cut it out. You can't drive me, Screwy. He can't come back. He's dead. Six feet deep. That's where he'll stay forever. We tried to fight it, but it was no use. Gertie was rattled, and I, I was taking it pretty hard myself. 
We stuck to the racket. There was too much dough in it to give in so quick. Besides, I didn't believe it. I didn't care what kind of noises they made. They made plenty, I'm telling you now. I'm through. Pull yourself together, Gertrude. Look, I'm through. I tell you, I can't stand any longer. I'm finished, Marty. Stop talking like a fool. Look, I saw your face tonight. We heard that laugh. You turned as white as a sheep. Well, I, I knew better, though, when I thought it over. It was one of the customs. It must have been. That's all it was, Gertie. Well, I wish I could believe it. Then who do you think it was for the love of my... What's going on in your mind? That laugh, Marty. I've heard that laugh before. It belonged to Leon. I guess we should never have held that last seance. We should have left well enough alone. But I got a tip that a plainclothes copper was coming down to make another investigation. We had to go through with it then and put on an act. So I got Gertie two stiff whiskeys and finished a couple myself. And then when the crowd came over and got themselves comfortable, put out the lights and, and Gertie got started. We are now in communication with the spirit world. Are there any questions? Yes, there are. Who are you, sir? Detective Fielding. And um, what is the question which you wish to convey to those who have passed? I'd like to hear from your husband, Mrs. Leon. My husband? Yes. One well, or two things I'd like to ask him. My husband... It's hard to communicate with him, sir. I cannot get a vibration. Try a bit harder. No. No, it's impossible. I... Sunset, promise and fulfillment, birth and death. The whole drama of life is written in the sands of time. We 
present a new series of radio programs, The Clock. Ever since the invention of the wheel, man has been doing his utmost to outstrip time. A century ago, it took weeks to cross the continent by covered wagon. A decade ago, it took only days by train. Now, on a modern airplane, you can span the distance in hours. And if our civilization has its way with the supersonic aircraft, you can leave New York at 2 in the afternoon and arrive in Los Angeles at 1. That's fast. But I know of something even faster. The route that a murderer takes to the grave. They call me Consuelo when I was born. That's Spanish or something. Ah, not that I'm Spanish. My father said the name on a shampoo advertisement and thought it was cute. Oh, but it fits me fine. You see, I'm sort of Latin looking with black hair, brown eyes, and lashes down here. And I match my complexion against the babies. I like to dance and have fun, and I've got no bad habits. The boys call me the perfect babe. But there's one thing I like better than good times, and even looking at myself in the mirror all day long. I love to take things. Oh, it's not stealing. I mean, I don't take things to get money out of it. I just get a kick out of picking up something when nobody's looking, that's all. A doctor once called it kleptomania, whatever that is. Well, he was adorable, too. He was the only thing I missed when I ran away. Oh, but that was months ago when I first met Charlie. It was in a department store, the kind I like to visit when I get the urge. May I help him? Oh, yes, please. Those gloves are very pretty. May I see them, please? Size six. Of course. Ah, uh, here you are. They're genuine lizard, the latest thing. Oh, uh, let me see the other pair in the showcase over there. Yes, sir. These? Yeah, that's right. Oh, bring out the other two pairs right next to it, if it's not too much trouble. Oh, not at all. These are pigskin. The others are suede. Oh, on my side? Yes, ma'am. They're awful pretty. What's that in the showcase behind your back? Here? Oh, they're not your sizes. Oh, and they're just what I wanted. Don't you have another pair? Not in size six. Oh. Well, then let it go. Oh, thank you so much. You're very welcome. Just a second, baby. I beg your pardon? Shopping. Who are you? Just a guy with good eyes, so let me see the bag. Huh? Oh, hold the nerve. <laughs> Why did you take the lizard gloves to suede? It isn't half as expensive. All right. All right. What? Take me up to the master and turn me in. Oh, baby, I'm not a store detective. No? Uh-huh. And your fingers... Aren't half as quick as you think they are. Have you had your lunch yet? No. And I'm starved. But well, look at a car outside and I could see them. Why didn't you turn me in, Charlie? Oh, maybe it's because I kind of go for your looks. Oh, you hit me. No. My hair's a mess. Oh, this dress is a fright. You'd get by in a potato sack or just died in the middle. Yeah, I'd feel more comfortable if it came from Calvello. How'd you like to go into business? Well, what kind of business? The kind that can net you a grand a week. Sounds like nice work if I can get it. You can get it. You know anything about poker? It's a card game, isn't it? Look, you've been cute or you just as dumb as you sound. Sure, it's a card game. What else would it be? I don't know how to play it. You don't have to know it. All you got to remember is how to read the cards. I'll do the rest. Oh, is that what you are? A gambler? <laughs> I'm an investor. I invest in other guys' mistakes. Oh. And what are you looking for? A match to light my cigarette. Oh, here's the light. Oh. Thanks. Now, here's a gimmick. I run a poker game in my apartment once a week. Big stuff. Only the top money boys are invited. Anybody comes in with less than 30 G's, just a convince What do I do? You? Oh, you serve sandwiches and drinks. For a thousand dollars? For a thousand dollars. You also get a little job on the side. When a big part comes up, you read the other guy's hand and you flash me a sign. Oh. Oh, what? Oh, that's nice. It'll be easy. You hand a guy a drink or sandwich or cigar from behind. When you lean over, you see his cards. And he give me a sign, and I know just how to play. Well, it sounds like fun. Mm, it's not fun, baby. It's business. The uh, fun comes later. How about it? You want in? I don't mind. When do we begin? Tomorrow night. I'll rehearse the signals with you after dinner. Oh, and Consuela. Yeah? Take my cigarette lighter out of your bag and put it back where it belongs. <laughs> You're all right, baby. You look terrific. <gasps> Thanks for the orchids, Charlie. That's okay. Oh, where's all the company? I'll be here in a couple of minutes. Now, you got everything straight? I think so. 
Don't make any mistakes. Oh, I never make mistakes, Charlie. Oh, it's not Let me lay you off. You'll eat later. Right now, you've got work to do. That's it. Answer the door, will you? Right away, Charlie. Good evening. Good evening. Who are you? Consuet is my name. Come in, won't you? Hey. Well, how goes it, Nicky boy? Who's the dame? Me, Consuet. I owe don't let your tongue hang out so far. This is Nicky Morgan, Kenny. They call him the blunt. I'm awfully glad to know you. You've got a nice shape. Uh-huh. Thank you. Too bad I saw her first, eh, Nikki? Mm. Would you like a sandwich? Kenny says she wants to help out tonight. She'll get you uh, anything you want. Yeah? Anything within reason. <laughs> okay, sit down, Nikki boy. Yeah, thanks. The boys will be here any minute now. Where do you start off with tonight? Uh, give me five grand. <laughs> that all you get for five thousand dollars? It's a hundred bucks a chip, sugar. Now, you just run over to that bar. Don't worry, you Sweet little head about the game. Uh, make it up straight while I'll have scotch in the rocks. Okay, Doc. I'll have a sandwich. Where'd you find her, Charlie? Uh, well, now, uh, Mickey boy, my grandma introduced us. <laughs> she got nice legs, too. You here for cards, Nicky? Huh? Oh, sure, but I can look, can I? Yeah, sure, you can look, but no touch. <laughs> Ah, I feel lucky tonight. Yeah? I think I'll take you and the boys for a hundred grand. And Nicky boy, how about a little side bet? Sure, why not? Twenty grand says I top you in the take. Twenty grand plus a date with Consuela against my twenty-five. Here I am, Nicky boy. About fifteen minutes later, the rest of the circus arrived. They came in different shapes and sizes, but they all had something in common. A bankroll. Pretty soon the chips were bouncing on the table and I was handing the sandwiches around. The signals I gave Charlie must have been the right ones because it wasn't long before he had most of the chips on his side of the table and some of the players had dropped out. Then they came to the last deal and that was the biggest part of all. I raise you five more, Charlie. I get ten. You must have a nice hand. <laughs> it cost you five thousand more to find out. Maybe you want a sandwich? I just had one. Oh. In fact, you've been handing me sandwiches all night. Nicky boy, that's what she's here for. So you told me. Come on, Nicky, put up a scram. Uh, I like my hand, Charlie. How much do you like your hand, Nicky? I like it so much, I'll put another 20 grand on it if you call and show. Uh, just you don't have that many chips in front of you. My checks are still good, aren't they? <laughs> good as cash. Are you sure you won't have a pickle or something, Nicky? I don't like pickles. Leave me alone, baby. He's getting kind of nervous. You never saw the day when Nicky Morgan got nervous. There's my 20 G's. Now, what have you got, Nicky boy? Full house. Queen's high. Oh, that's tough. Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> I got four tens. Oh, too bad, Nicky. Yeah. Yes, yeah, sweetheart. Too bad. Nicky looked at me for a second, and he smiled. It was the kind of a smile that gives you goose pimples. He was the last to leave the apartment, and he didn't shake hands with Charlie before he went. Yeah, it looks like you got clean, Nicky. Fortunes of war, you know. There's more where that came from. Yeah, better luck next week. You, um... Uh... I'm going to have this babe here next time we play. Why, any objection? Maybe. What kind? Her sandwiches come high. Don't like to eat them, stay home, Nicky boy. Maybe I will, Charlie, after I even the score. I'll sit in once more next week and see how it goes. Oh, come up any time. And maybe we can have a little private stud game one night. Just you and me? Just you and me. I'll let you know. Good night, Nicky. So long, brown eyes. Keep your hands straight. Hey. Hey, what'd I do with my pocket watch? Your watch? Did you have one when you came in? It was in my vest, hanging on the chair. Consuela. Yes, Charlie? Give him back his watch. His watch? Give it back to him. Dig it out. Uh, well, if the gentleman insists. He's got to hit your fingers, Nicky. <laughs> Just the kind of gag. Yeah, well, next time I come up here, I'll sit on my claw. <laughs> <laughs> no hard feelings, Nicky. <laughs> Ah, no hard feelings. I'm just as sure I can go along with a gag. We'll shake on it. He grabbed my fingers in his hairy paw and squeezed. But when he let go, there was a piece of paper in my palm. 
few minutes later, when Charlie wasn't looking, I opened the note and saw what he wrote. He left his phone number. And he told me to use it. Or else. Some women are like handsome clocks. Their lines are sleek. Their thinking is methodical and cold. Their minds, like the works of a timepiece, are made of steel. And they complete the ensemble with a chromium-plated heart. I called the phone number Nicky gave me, and he told me to come up. He owned as nice a place as Charlie did, only his was a penthouse that opened up the park. He was wearing a tiny silk dressing gown over his shirt and pants with one of those big dragons on the back of it. But he was even richer than Charlie was. The toothpick he stuck in his mouth was made of solid gold. Sit down, baby. Have a drink. The lady shouldn't have come here, Nicky. Why not? Charlie might get mad. Charlie can drop dead. He's nothing but a chiseling grafter. Anyway, you're here, so just forget about him. I guess you're sore about that watch. <laughs> nah, I'm not sore. I didn't really steal it. No, you were just holding it for me so it wouldn't break. You see, I like to take things. Oh. Mm. So I noticed. Sometimes it's just little things like jars of cold cream or, or a bottle of perfume. But you've got even worse habits, honey. Have I? Yeah. You called the shots last night, doll. And you fooled everybody but me. I should have known you were too smart. Yeah. And so should Charlie. Well, what are you going to do? Well, there's lots of things I could do. For instance, I could go back to Charlie's joint with a forty-five and blow his crooked head off. Oh. And then I could take you out under that balcony there and push you over the side. I wouldn't like that. Sure you wouldn't like that. You wouldn't be half as nice to look at after you landed on the street. Why didn't you tell Charlie you knew? Because I got bigger ideas, doll, and you're included. How much does that stinker pay you? I get a thousand dollars for every game. One grand. When he takes in fifty grand. Well, after all, I'm not experienced. And I got a feeling you're not as dumb as you sound. How would you like to work for me? But I've already got a job, Nicky. Now you'll have two of them. You'll keep on with Charlie, but you'll double-cross him for me. You'll give him cockeyed signals so he bets his ears off on every hand. And after we take him to the cleaners, you get a 50-50 split. Oh. Well, I'll, I'll have to think it over. You can do your thinking here. Suppose he catches me. Why should he? You did. This is different. He'll never figure you for a double cross. How about it? I guess I can't refuse. Not if you want to stay healthy. Anyway, why should you refuse? Charlie's got a face that could spoil your appetite. And I can match him cards and spades for dough. But what excuse can I give him when I cross his signals? Just tell him you forgot. All you got to do is work this once. Just once. When I get through with him, he won't have enough left to pay his laundry bill. Then, later, maybe we could work the boats. What boats? The big ones that go over from here to Europe. We travel first class, only the best. And the big-time suckers will fall in our laps. I always wanted to go to Paris. <laughs> you're practically in Paris right now, if you play ball. <sighs> Charlie wasn't so hard to work with, but I suppose a girl must think of herself every once in a while, too. It's just one thing, baby. Yeah? Don't run this double cross into a triple play. Or them orchids you're wearing might turn out to be lilies. Don't you trust me? Oh, sure. And I'll even trust you better when I get to know you more. When are you coming over to Charlie's place again? Tonight, maybe. And I'm coming along. We're playing stud poker together with one card buried. And we're playing for 500 bucks a chip. That sounds awfully extravagant. It's steep enough to break me if I walk out a loser. But I can finish Charlie inside of two hours. I'll be waiting for you, Nicky. And I'll do my best to please. Yeah, I will. Why'd you come over here for anyway? 
I thought I wasn't supposed to see you till tomorrow. Oh, Nikki called me. Oh, did? Mm, she's coming over to my place for a two-handed game of stud tonight. What stud? Oh, it's a five-card poker with four cards open on the table, one card's buried, each guy only sees his own. Oh. It'll be even easier to take Mickey Morgan that stud than it was before. Mm. Did you use the same signal? No. This time, all I have to know is that one card. So I'm changing things around. Besides, you know, I had a feeling Mickey boy was getting wise the last trip. I'll take it easy when you use those winks. Uh, that leg's got eyes in the back of his head. Yeah, I'd be careful, Charlie. Yeah, tonight's the night, baby. Boat putting up the works in cash. How much? Quarter of a million bucks apiece. No wonder I'll come out with half a million. And the loser gets a free pass to the poorhouse. Sounds exciting. After we clean them out, we'll take a little trip. And play the boats? Where'd you learn about playing the boats? Well, I don't know. You started the movie once, I guess. Why? Because that's what Mickey used to do. Really? For a dame who don't know the difference between clothes, poker, and stud, that's pretty smart I stuff. I guess I learned quickly. Yeah. Well, just don't forget your lessons when Nicky shows up tonight. Charlie? Hmm? Suppose he cut cr- onto us. What would have happened? Oh, he'd do a little too, this. That's what scares me. Oh, you don't need to be scared. Not as long as I got this in my hip. I didn't know you carried a gun. Oh, it's not the kind of thing you advertise in the paper. You'll have a lot of money when you take Nicky to the cleaner. Yeah, enough to get by on. And what about me? All I get out of it is a measly thousand. Ah, no. No, you get more than that can swim. Do I? No. You get me. Oh. Oh, what? Oh, isn't that nice? Hey, what are you doing, kidding me? No. I'll sing along, Charlie. You can count on that. Charlie's apartment. I wore my low-cut evening gown with the ankle strap gold sandals. I had a girl from the beauty parlor come up to do my nails and hair. And I took the scissors and a bottle of pies just to keep from getting bored. By the time I got to Charlie's, I had a plan all worked out. You're late, baby. I came over as fast as I could. I've got something to tell you, Charlie. Yeah, what? Mickey called me just after you left my hotel room. What for? He made me an offer to crush you. To crush me? By changing the signal. You're not a wreck. You're not getting so you can't trust anybody? I know. I told him I'd go through with it just so I could stall for time. He said he'd protect me if it didn't work by putting a bullet in your head. Yeah? Oh, I'm scared, Charlie. He'll kill us both if you start winning. Nobody's going to start winning, honey, because there isn't going to be any game. Oh, well, what are you going to do? I'm going to finish him off before he gets me. You're okay, baby. You won't be sorry you're stuck. Do you think you have his money with him? Sure, I got mine. That'll get his, too. Easy way. Oh. I'm not here, see? Make him talk and show his dough and get out of the way. I'll pot him from the bedroom. Now, you be careful, honey, and get out of the way. Hello, Nikki. How goes it, sweetheart? Oh, Charlie isn't here. No? Where'd he go? I had to get some cards. He wanted clean decks. Well, the good they're going to do it. You look even better tonight than you did before. Oh, like my dress? I like it fine. Did you bring your money? I always bring my money. Charlie's got his. Not yet, he ain't. He's getting his tonight. I mean, he's got his money on him. A quarter of a million dollars in thousand dollar bills. What's the matter, baby? Hmm? Oh, no, nothing. You look nervous. Why? I'm taking a big chance tonight. Forget it. In three hours, we'll be out of here, loaded with your boyfriend's dough. In three hours, you'll be out of here all right, Nicky boy, loaded in a hearse. What is this? Oh, this is the payoff, Nicky boy. What's the idea of the gun? It keeps my hands busy. You cross me, you little child. Uh, 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 uh. That's no way to talk to a lady, Nicky boy. I should have known. I should have had more sense. That's right. You should have figured that a guy with a face like yours wouldn't stand a chance with a dame like Consuela. And what's more, Nicky boy, she's too expensive for you. I can match you nickel for nickel, Buster. <laughs> Not after tonight, you can. Chill out, Nicky. <laughs> Holding me up, big shot? Take the dough out of his overcoat pocket, baby. He keeps it on the inside. Sure, take it. And when the boys hear about this, you won't be able to step into the street in the daylight from here to China. Oh, but nobody is going to hear about it, Nicky boy. Do you want to know why? Huh? Oh. Darling, no! Nicky 
boy. Dead child. Give me the dough. You killed him. Come on, let's get out of here. Oh, my God. What's the matter with you? Oh, me, Charlie. I think I'm kind of... I'm swimming. I found his arms while he was still holding the gun, and I caught the hand that held it between us. As he tried to lift me up, I slid my arm between his body and mine, and before he knew what I was doing, I twisted the gun around until it pointed at his jaw and pressed his fingers. You have to admit it was clever. Mickey was on the floor with a bullet in his head, and Charlie was lying right next to him holding the gun. It was a clear case of murder and suicide, with yours truly getting the cast. And they thought I was dumb. Isn't that a laugh? Too bad they caught up with me, though. I'll never get a chance to spend all that lovely money here in jail. When they came to my apartment, they found me with what they called direct and damaging evidence. You see, before I left, I just couldn't help stealing Charlie's gun. sitting in the death house with your colleagues, watching a beautiful young woman named Consuela being strapped into the electric chair to pay for her crime against the state. You would see the switch being pulled and catch a glimpse of death in its most sordid phase. And if you were a sharp-eyed reporter, you might be puzzled by the expression of the guard who set Consuela's head and wrist electrodes. of radio programs, The Clock. The passage of time and the forward trend of civilization have both had a profound influence in changing man from a polygamous animal to one who practices monogamy. In the reign of Solomon the king, a thousand wives was the custom. Today, one wife, or at least one wife at a time, is the prevailing fashion. But there are still some members of the species Homo sapiens who are loath to accept their monogamous status. I'm not referring to the bigamists either, mind you. As a matter of fact, the gentlemen of whom I speak rarely marry at all. But they have a list of conquests to their credit that would put a sultan to shame, and they seem to forget the fact that one woman can be more than enough for any man to handle. I know collar, Red. Friend, you'll never see my puss in a subway poster when you're hanging from a strap. That's why I, I can't figure the reason they go for me in such a great big way. <laughs> I'm talking about women. Fat women, thin women, blondes and brunettes. They all make a grab for Alex. It can't be the way I talk. My education don't amount to much, and I'm a little rough around the edges. And my bill wouldn't win no prizes in a model's magazine. So maybe it's my face. Yeah, maybe it's the way I smile and look them in the eye that makes them gulp like flowers and ooze right into my arms. Anyway, I ain't complaining because I like them just as much as they like me. <laughs> oh, boy, how I love them. I take them all shapes and sizes from 18 to 85. And when I say I take them, mister, I mean I take them for everything they got. For instance, there was Lola. Uh, when I met her, she was wearing a black satin evening gown with lace all over the middle. The skin was as white as a hunk of ermine. And her teeth were straighter than the keys on a baby grand. We did the town together from 52nd Street to the village. And by the time I took her home in a taxi cab, you know, we were getting to be old friends. Oh, Alex. Kiss me. 
kiss me hard. Well, I'm afraid I've been smearing your lipstick. I've never met a man like you before. What is it about you that makes you so attractive? Listen, stop taking me apart. Just relax, honey, and I'll do the talk. Where's he going? What? The cab driver. Where's he taking us? To your apartment. The address you gave. Oh, no. No, 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 he can't do that. I, what? I, I must be crazy. You, you must be driving me out of my mind. Well, what's the matter? Ain't you paid your rent up? I... I'm married, Alex. You... you you're what? I got a husband. What? Oh, Lola, how could you do a thing like that to me? I know I should have told you before. I just didn't want to lose you. Oh, ain't there a woman in the world I can trust? Oh, Alex, don't look at me like that, please. Please, darling, it doesn't make any difference. Driver, stop this hack. Alex, please. When will we see each other again? Uh, I ain't sure. I'll call in the morning between 10 and 12. My husband's always at his office then. Now, what business is he in? Oh, he's a diamond guy. Oh, he buys diamonds? Alex, please, tell me I'll see you. Well, I'll, uh, I'll think it over, baby, and uh, let you know. <laughs> I let her stew for a couple of days, then I gave her a ring. Inside a week, I had her eating out of my hand. Then came an evening when I figured it was time to blow. Who is it? It's Lola, darling. Let me in. Oh, Alex, something terrible happened. I... What's that suitcase doing on your bed? I'm packing. Packing for what? I'm getting out of here for a while. But, but, but you can't leave me now. Well, who says I can't? you borrowed. I'll mail them to you tomorrow. Alex, my husband's coming home sooner than I expected. He'll arrive tonight. So what? He'll open his safe and find the diamonds missing. But what does he do? Count every hunk of glass he's got? You only gave me three. You told me that you were using those stones for security on loan. You said you'd give them back to me whenever I wanted yeah, them. Yeah, well, you'll get them. You'll get them. Stop hiring. Alex, I've got to have them tonight. Listen, I'm busy. I've got to make a train. You stole them, Alex. Why, you're nothing but a thief. Look, will you go home? Go home? I'll call the police. That's what I'll do. I'll put you in jail for this. There's the phone. Use it. And then you can call your husband down to identify the loot. You're despicable. Yeah. You're rotten. Through. Get out of my way, baby. You're blocking the door. Alex. Get out of my way before I kick your pretty teeth in. So long, Lola. It's been lovely knowing you. And just to show you how I feel, I'm going to mark you triple A on my suckers list. See what I mean? They just can't keep away from me. I'm the ladies' home companion, the dame's delight. And the smarter they come, the harder they fall. <laughs> That's why I had to bite my lip to keep from laughing when I first met Ethel. Yeah, she was a waitress at the drive-in near L.A., cute as a pretzel with big blue eyes and a dumb expression. I don't usually mix business with pleasure, but uh, I only go for the dolls who pay off. But I figured this time I didn't have to go in a make for a profit. I was just going to keep her happy for laughs. Yes, sir. Oh, what do you got that's tasty, baby, uh, outside of yourself? Oh, we got hamburger, steak burger, cheeseburger, and whale burger. Well, give me a sardine on Ryan, a cup of coffee with a hunk of cheesecake on a side. You get that? Uh-huh. What you looking at, Blue Eyes? You sort of remind me of someone. Yeah? A friend of mine. He looks just like you. You're build and everything. He's even got a scar in his hand like yours. And it's very uncanny. Oh, now, you don't have to go into a routine like that if you want to get to know me, Blondie. I'm the kind who picks up easy. Gee, he's just spitting in it. Hey, when do you knock off today? Why? Maybe I'll run around and take you for a ride. I don't go for rides with men I wasn't introduced to. My name is Alex. What's yours? Ethel. Okay, we're introduced. Now, hustle your frame inside that restaurant and get them victuals, and when you come back, we'll make a date. Oh, you should have seen her eyes when I told her I was taking her out. <laughs> that poor dumb bunny acted like I just gave her a thousand shares of American TNT. Yeah, sometimes I think I should have been born quintuplet just so I could spread myself around a little more. Well, about two hours later, I'm back at the drive and waiting for Ethel to finish her stint. She walks out at eight sharp, wearing a dress that fit like the skin on a weenie. When she crossed her gams, I nearly, I nearly stripped my gears. Where to, Sugar Plum? Oh, I don't care. Just so I get some air. 
Hey, how come a doll like you got to serve up garbage to every jerk who comes along? You, you know, you are being pictures. You think so? Sure, yeah. You ever had a screen test? No. Well, I got pulled at Superman, the president of me, just like that. Maybe I'll talk to him tomorrow, see what I can do. You in the picture business, Alan? Nah, nah, that ain't big time. I'm in a hotter racket. I promote. Well, what do you promote? Well, right now, I'm working on you. What's the matter? Nothing. Well, is something wrong with the car? Hey, on a level. Are you as dizzy as you sound? Alex, what are you doing? Oh, I'm going to give you a great big kiss. Mm. Oh. That make you happy? Oh. Gee, you even kiss like Stanley. Stanley? Who is Stanley? The fellow I know who looks like you, Stanley Kibbe. Say, listen, how about you can a chatter? You're out with me now, not with Stanley. Ethel. Yeah? Uh, maybe I better take you home. All right. I'm used to gals who pay a little attention to me. Maybe I, I won't even see you again. All right. What? Whatever you say, Alex. Oh. Oh. Whatever you say. Well, it wasn't that I lost my touch. It was just that the dame was too dizzy to even fall. The way she talked, you'd think her head was in a plaster cast. From the neck up, she was absolutely numb. I drove her back to a flat in L.A., figuring I'd dump her and call her the night. When I got to the front of the house, something happened to change my mind. Well, thanks for the ride, Alex. Yeah, don't mention it. Next time I eat Saudi night rye, I won't pick up on the extras. What? Skip it, spongehead. Go on up and put your hair in curlers for the night. Oh, my goodness. Now what? It's Stanley. Where? See? He's been waiting in front of the house. Oh, I'll bet he's mad at me. I completely forgot we had a day. Gosh, oh, there you are. Oh, Sam, I should have known you'd be running with a hobo. Oh, don't be rude, Sam. I ought to shock you, mister. That's what I ought to do. Keep them hands in your pockets, Stanley. I'm going home. I could have climbed out of the car and spilled Stanley all over the sidewalk in 60 seconds. I could have laid him out like a rubber mat. Why didn't I? Well, because they had different ideas. Yeah, you see, she was right about Stanley. It wasn't just a gag. In build and color, the guy was a ringer for me. He even had the same scar on his left hand. Our faces were a little different, maybe, but that could be fixed. For what? <laughs> yeah, I'll tell you, for what? And it came to me, just like a flash. Up to then, it was small-time stuff. A grand here, three grand there. Nothing really big to sink my claws in. I had black men and larceny wraps over my skull from... Albany to Albuquerque, so I... If I branched out a little, what did I have to lose? The idea was right. And I had a feeling Ethel was dumb enough to go for it. The only one who might kick was Stanley, and you couldn't blame him. <laughs> After all, he was going to get elected to, to be a corpse. <laughs> is like a watch that runs on time. She clicks away with a dependability you can rely on. A clever woman is a watch that runs too fast. And a scheming woman is a watch without a face. But beware of the female who professes ignorance. For she may be the time clock you often find attached to a bomb. I waited a week before I spring the plan on Ethel. I knew I was taking a long shot by ringing her in on it, but I figured I could always pass it off with a gag and a laugh if she would put up a kick. So, yeah, uh, whatever happened to Stanley, Sugar? Oh, he's mad at me. Cut us. I never liked him anyway. He used to come over here with ketchup stains on his tie. Ethel, uh, Ethel, you, you ever been in trouble? What do you mean? No, 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 no. You, you know, you, uh, you ever had a run-in with a law? Oh, no. Oh, that's too bad. It is? I had a little business proposition to make to you. But what kind of a proposition? Well, uh, you, you like money, Ethel. Oh, I love it. Mm, lots of money, yeah. Mm. Say, how would you like to split 200,000 bucks with me? <laughs> oh, Alex, you're tired. No, I'm on a level, baby. I got a tie-up that's foolproof. All I need is a dame with knife, and I'll handle the rest. But what's that got to do with my having trouble with the law? 
I just wanted to know if you'd had any practice. You see, uh, you see, my plan isn't exactly uh, legitimate. No. No. Uh, in order to get what we're after, we got to kill a guy. Oh. All right, all right, all right. Forget it. Forget it. It's, uh, it's only a mink coat and a trip around the world. You're a simple type, I know. You don't like diamonds or furs or perfume that cost a hundred bucks an ounce. No. No, Alex, I just couldn't do it. Not for a 50% split on 200 grand? I don't know how you could even mention such a thing. You must be joking. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. It's only a gag. <laughs> Make believe I never said it. But, uh, you know, if you happen to get a yen for a little pin money this winter, just let me know, huh? Maybe you'll change your mind. <laughs> Yeah. Alex? Yeah, Ethel. I've been thinking it over. Yeah. Do you still want me to work with you? Yeah. Then come right over. Yeah. Now listen closely, baby. I'm listening. Face off, we get married. Married? What for? Now look, look, I don't like a ball and chain no more than you do, but it's the way we gotta work. We get hitched, and then I take out an insurance policy for a hundred grand with double indemnity. What's that? What's what? Oh, double whatever you say. Well, it's, uh, well, it's, it's double the take, sweetheart. If I get killed in an accident, I collect twice. You getting killed in an accident? No, I'm not getting killed. Stanley is. Sta what? Yeah, and when I find his body, he'll be in my car with my identification on him. They'll call you down to the morgue to see the body, and you'll recognize his clothes, see? The insurance company will check the scar on his hand... And that makes it final. Oh. Yeah, you, get, you, you got everything straight now? I think so. Okay, now right after the wedding, you get Stanley on the phone. Well, I say to him? Well, tell him you want to see him. Say you've been crying your eyes out since he left. Pick him up in my car and drive him up to the heights. You know that spot overlooking the cliff? Yeah. And that's where you park and wait for me. Now, you, now you, you think you can handle him? Oh, I guess so. But what happens after we park? You leave that to me. She did like I said and Stanley fell. <laughs> I was waiting at the bend of the road near the cliff at 9 p.m. when I drove up. When she stole the car, Stanley grinned like a hungry hyena. But his dopey smile only stayed on his pen until I walked up and laid him cold before he could open his mouth. <laughs> okay, he's cold. I would just pull him in front of the steering wheel. Get his hands around. That's it. And where's my wallet? Oh. Here, slip this into his inside pocket and take his wallet out. And now we'll twist the wheel so she points for the cliff. Put her in first. Ethel, pr push that starter button, baby. And then get out quick. So long, Stanley. Hold on to your hat. Ten minutes, I was down the mountain and checking the wreck. Yeah, he was pretty badly banged up. He couldn't recognize his face. That was the important thing. I checked her once more without touching the body and then lambed out of there with Ethel. Three hours later, she was at the morgue, identifying a stiff. You sure it's your husband, Mrs. Blink? I bought him that suit for a wedding present. Oh, I know it's him. All right, boys, put him back. <laughs> Do you know if your husband was despondent or something like that? Oh, no. Alex was always as chipper as could be. The fact that he took out an expensive policy and then got himself killed a couple of days later seems that the insurance are just worried. You mean they think he killed himself? Yeah. They don't pay off on suicide, you know. But they can't prove it, Mrs. Bleak, so you're okay. For my part, I'm listing it as an accidental death. <laughs> What could be sweeter? It worked so good, you'd think Stanley trying to help us along. I stayed on a cover for two weeks while Ethel collected the dough, and then I showed up at her apartment. Who is it? Alex, baby. Who? Alex. Everything all set, sugar? What? You got the dough, okay? Who are you? Who? Who do you want? Hey, 
Say, what kind of a gimmick is this? You know who I am. I'm Alex Bleak, your husband. Oh, but that's ridiculous. What? My husband's dead. S wait a minute. He was killed in an accident. I never saw you before in my life. And if you know what's good for you, you'd better not let me see you again. And I thought she was dumb. I figured she was thicker than a hunk of cement. Dumb, huh? huh. I shouldn't be that dumb. The party wasn't over yet, and I wasn't finished with that peroxide blonde. First, I wrote a letter and signed it, Stanley Kibbe. Yeah, Stanley Kibbe, the guy we'd killed in my car. I told her that we were through, and I asked her not to do anything foolish. I said she'd find someone else as nice as me. She mustn't think that life's no good just because I ain't around. Then I began to keep an eye on her. I trailed her from morning till night, and I knew she was nervous by the way she kept looking behind her every time she hit the street. Finally, she made the move I was waiting for. She drew every nickel she had from the bank in cash. And it didn't take any fortune teller to figure she was packing to leave. Well, I beat her home from the bank and jimmied my way into her apartment. <laughs> by the time she came back, the reception committee was all set. Hello, baby. Alex! Keep your voice down, honey. This rod I got ain't as phony as you are. What do you want? That dough you just drew from the bank. Please. Shell out. I'll make it snappy. Gee, Alex, you're not being very nice. <laughs> oh, my name ain't Alex. It's Stanley, remember? Come on, hand it over. Don't I get to keep any of it? After the crush you handed me, put the roll on the table. Oh, well, if that's the way you feel about it. Hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. You know, as big a chiseler as you are, I can't help feeling sorry for you. Really? Besides, you're just dumb enough to, to turn me in. Even though you'd be taking a rap as well as me. So I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll let you keep your half. Oh, Alex, you're so good to me. Mm -hmm. Now, we part friends, huh? Okay? Uh-huh. Alex, let's, let's drink on it, baby. Then we can kiss each other off. Uh, what do you got on that side, both scotch? Yeah. Well, never mind, I'll do it. I'll take half the dough from that rolling table. You gotta make sure it's only half. Oh, I never cheat you, Alex. You wouldn't know that by now. Yeah, sure, I know. Well, here's to us, huh? Happy days, Alex. Here's mud in your eye. Yeah. <laughs> Bottoms up. Well, it was bottoms up. When there was enough cyanide in the glass, I gave her to conquer rhino. Five minutes later, she was flat on the floor, and I stuffed my letter into a mitt and left. <laughs> Neat, huh? Looked like a clear case of suicide, and she did it just for me. I thought it was pretty smart to sign that letter Stanley Kibbe. I was using his name now, since I didn't have one of my own, I was supposed to be dead. And just by leaving myself wide open by writing that letter, I'd be safe. The cops wouldn't figure I'd be dumb enough to leave it in her hand after knocking her off. That's what you call, uh, reverse psychology. I'd still be covered in case somebody knew she'd be running around with a guy named Kibby, and the cops tried to look me up. When I got to my flat, I planned one more alibi just for atmosphere. Got hold of a lot of toothache medicine and wrapped the bandage around my jaw. Then I lay on a couch and waited. And... Uh, uh, come in. Finally, Kibby? Yeah, yeah, that's me. Detective Haley. This your letter? Uh, wh where'd you find that? A man of a woman named Ethel Kane. Ethel? She just killed herself. What? Ethel? Oh, she shouldn't have done it. That's why I wrote the letter. I had a feeling this might happen. I was going to call her up tonight and talk some sense into her. But his toothache was driving me crazy. Toothache, huh? But, yeah, uh, you, you you wouldn't know uh, what to do about a toothache, would you? Oh, sure. Sure, we'll fix you up, mister. At headquarters. Well, before I got a chance to make a movie, he had the handcuffs on. And an hour later, they put me on a the grill. They had me with my goddess down, and I knew it. And I was finished when I finally found a dough. The trial was quick, as you might have read. And half an hour ago, he told me the governor wasn't giving out with any reprieve. 
But if I hadn't pulled that toothache gag, I, I'd have been sitting pretty with a roll of money big enough to stuff a chair. Yeah, if that dumb blonde lunkhead only had enough sense to tell me. How should I know? How should I know her boyfriend, Stanley, was a dentist? Yeah, a dentist. <laughs> California, execution is carried out by means of lethal gas. And so tonight we trust that Alex Bleak, alias Stanley Kibbe, will discover a satisfying and permanent cure for an aching tooth. The clock will be heard again next week. It's written by Lawrence Clee and Hart McGuire is the voice of the clock. Alex was played by Ken Wayne, Wynn Nelson was Ethel. Others were Moira Redmond, John Ewart and Brian James. The clock, directed by John Saul, is a Grace Gibson radio production. Oh.